Hi everyone. Welcome to MS Research Australia's fourth Progress in MS Research live update. Thank you for joining us as we stream across Australia and around the world. We host this event every year for people living with MS, their family, friends and carers to ensure that you are all fully informed about the latest developments in MS research. I'm Dr. Julia Moraghan, the Head of Research at MS Research Australia. I will be your host today in Sydney, alongside Brioni Heinu, who is joining us from Brisbane. Brioni is a person who is living herself with MS, having been diagnosed four years ago, and is one of our top fundraisers in the Kiss Goodbye to MS virtual fitness campaign, the May 50K, which I'm sure many of you will have generously supported or taken part in earlier this year. Thank you for joining us as a co-host today. Over to you in Brisbane co-host this event with you today. Look, events like this are such a great way to connect people living with MS, such as myself, but also our family and friends with all the latest research developments that are happening. So many thanks must go to MS Research Australia for bringing together some of the top MS experts from across Australia today for this live update. Now, on behalf of MS Research Australia, I'd like to begin today's session by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the various lands throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that same respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Thanks, Brioni. I would like to take a moment to thank our major sponsor for this event, Bristol Myers Squibb. Now I know this year has been tough for all of us with the unexpected COVID-19 pandemic and the uncertainty that that has brought, but it has also been an extremely challenging time for MS researchers across the board with many projects unable to progress over the last six months. I would like to take a moment to reassure you that MS Research Australia is doing absolutely everything we can to ensure that the research projects that we fund continue and are not left to language. We really don't want to see the incredible work conducted by our MS research teams fall by the wayside this year. And as such, we have committed $275,000 to support our researchers to bring these amazing projects to completion. Now, research is, in, is progressing at an impressive rate, with new discoveries being made all the time. But we couldn't fund MS Research without you. It is only through the incredible generosity of people like you who are committed to making a difference that enables us to fund vital MS Research here in Australia. If you'd like to be part of helping us stop and reverse MS, please head to msra.org.au slash donate or click on the orange donate button on the homepage of our website. I can't tell you how much we appreciate your support. Now I'll hand back over to Brioni in Brisbane, who will give you some more insight into what we have coming up for you today. Thanks, Julia. So yeah, let's run through what we have in store. Uh, we do have a very exciting lineup of MS experts joining us here today, sharing some very informative insights from their work in MS. We're going to be kicking off with Associate Professor Kayleen Young, who will be talking about the future of remyelina remyelination therapies, rather. And then we're going to cross to Associate Professor Todd Hardy, who will be discussing new MS treatments from the lab to the clinic, a neurologist's insight. Then rounding out the trio is Dr. Yvonne Leamon, who will be providing some information on managing MS through adapting your lifestyle, a holistic approach. There should be more details about our speakers and their topics should be showing on your screen right now. The session doesn't end there though, as we will then have the opportunity to put your pre-submitted questions to the MS experts in our Q&A panel discussion. Thank you to those of you who have actually sent questions into us when you registered for this event. There's a great selection of topics that people are asking about. And I know the team at MS Research Australia have been busy collating these for today. So without further ado, I'm going to hand back over to Julia in Sydney. Thanks, Brioni. So let's get started. I'm very excited to welcome our first expert, Associate Professor Kayleen Young, who is joining us from Hobart in Tasmania. 
Kayleen is the theme leader for brain health and disease research and the head of the glial research team at the Menzies Institute for Medical Research in Tassie, carrying out research that aims to identify, test and translate novel myelin repair treatments for people with MS. As a postdoctoral researcher, Associate Professor Young became increasingly interested in the population of brain cells called oligodendrocyte progenitor cells, or OPCs, and initiated research to investigate their function in the adult brain. She has discovered that OPCs generate new myelinating oligodendrocytes, the cell type that is lost in MS. Kayleen has a number of accolades under her belt. She's very impressive. These include being the inaugural recipient of the Metcalf Prize for Stem Cell Research. She was a 2015 Tasmanian Tall Poppy Science awardee, and she was also the inaugural MS Research Australia and Macquarie Group Foundation Fellow. So today we will hear her speak about the future of remyelination therapies. Thank you for joining us from Hobart and welcome Associate Professor Young. So we hear a lot about the importance of myelin and remyelination in MS. For those that are not familiar with this terminology, could you give us a brief explanation? In the nervous system, nerve cells carry information as electrical impulses. But like the electrical wires in our house, they are insulated so they can do that. And that insulation is called myelin. Now, in multiple sclerosis, that insulation gets stripped away. And when we talk about remyelination, we're talking about the rewrapping or the re-insulation of those nerve cells. Um, and that is what we're trying to achieve when we talk about um, remyelination and brain repair. So... What different types of remyelination therapies are being looked at by your researchers at the moment? Over the last decade, or two decades now, we've actually been studying a lot about how the brain works. And we've been studying a population of brain cells called oligodendrocyte progenitor cells, or OPC. They're kind of like an immature type of cell or a stem cell that's in the brain that has the capacity to make new oligodendrocytes and they're the cells that die in multiple sclerosis. So a lot of what we're trying to do is to push these OPCs to make more new oligodendrocytes to repair the brain um, and to achieve remyelination. Um, so we're looking at this from a number of different angles, but one of the ones that we've really been focusing on recently is trying to increase the activity of nerve cells and this gets detected by OPCs and pushes them towards this remyelination. We're doing this using a technology that is a non-invasive form of brain stimulation called transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS. And this, um, this magnetic brain stimulation um, will ultimately, kind of like massaging the activity of the brain, to, um, to try and push the OPCs towards brain repair. It's incredibly interesting, the investigation that you're doing into the non-invasive technique. The magnetic brain stimulation therapy that we're trialling is currently um, in clinical trial. So we've taken it through all of the preclinical testing and it's, it's been really promising. So we're now taking it into the clinic and we've started our phase one safety trial in people with multiple sclerosis. So we're delivering magnetic brain stimulation by putting a magnet above the head, and this will ultimately um, induce a small magnetic current in the brain, and we're hoping this will promote myelin repair. So by the end of 2021, we should have an answer um, for our safety trial, and the hope is that after that, we can roll that out um, to include other parts of Australia in a larger um, study looking at how well this can promote brain repair in people with MS. It's incredibly interesting, the investigation that you're doing into the non-invasive technique. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what stage that research is at? Within our lab, we actually have uh, brain repair treatments that are at various different stages of development. So some of them we're still going through and undertaking um, like the laboratory-based trials. And then we do have uh, one of the, the magnetic brain stimulation that is currently in the clinic, that we've translated to the clinic. 
Uh, but we believe actually this is a really good pathway for starting to move more treatments through to the clinic more rapidly. And I'm expecting that we will see a lot more brain repair treatments becoming available for people with multiple sclerosis, um, whether it be through our pipeline or others that are um, being carried out in Australia and overseas in the next five to 10 years. It's just so exciting, the work that you're doing with the TMS. So what do you think the future looks like for remyelination therapies? Where are we going to go next? And how soon do you think we'll be able to offer remyelination therapies to people with MS? I think this is an exciting time for brain repair research in the multiple sclerosis field. Uh, I think that we're actually quite close to this being able to be something that people with MS will see in the clinic. Um, I am thinking a five to 10 year time frame. These treatments would not be something um, that would necessarily be given in isolation. I see them as being adjuncts, so working alongside people's current treatment regime um, so that they can help um, stop the further accumulation of disability. Um, and in some case, perhaps even have a further restorative effect um, in restoring some functions that may have been impaired um, to really allow people to, um, especially people that are newly diagnosed, to look at MS as something where they don't have to worry about disability being a part of the future. Thank you, Kayleen. That was so interesting. Remyelination is something that the MS community is keen to know more about and your research just sounds so promising. Now back to you in Brisbane, Brioni. What have we got coming up next? Uh, so, so next up, we're, up, going, we're to going to hear a neurology insight, insight on new, on new MS, MS treatments from the from lab to the clinic. clinic. Uh, from uh, from the the professor professor appropriate Professor Sahadi is a staff specialist neurologist at Concord Hospital, a clinical associate professor in medicine at the University of Sydney and co-director of the MS Clinic at the Brain and Mind Centre. In addition, he is co-chair of the New South Wales MS Clinical Trials Network and a principal in investigator, rather, on several MS clinical trials. He's also co-editor of the medical journal Advances in Clinical Neuroscience and Rehabilitation. Oh, what a CV. Uh, Associate Professor Hardy's clinical and research interests are in the field of neuroimmunology, but his main focus is on multiple sclerosis, including the atypical forms of demyelination and other neuroinflammatory diseases of the central nervous system. So let's head back over to Sydney to welcome Associate Professor Todd Hardy. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us for this event today. It's very much appreciated. Thanks for having now, me. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so look, I think it goes without saying that obviously 2020 has not been a great year from an overall medical professional perspective with the COVID-19 pandemic and how that's affected us all. But I believe it's actually been a very promising year for new treatments being approved for people living with MS. So can you tell us a bit more about what's actually been happening? Yeah, you're right. It has been a promising year despite um, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, obviously, the uh, pandemic uh, taking place around the world um, uh, early in the year caused all of us uh, MS neurologists and our patients to pause for thought a little bit about how we were managing uh, MS. Um, and it meant that we did uh, delay initiation of some drugs. Uh, we did make some, uh, we, we did avoid transitioning and, uh, and switching from certain drugs to other drugs uh, as a result of it all. Uh, but look, as we've uh, learned more about the pandemic, um, uh, we've become more comfortable in continuing to treat MS for the most part, depending on which part of the country we're in and what the coronavirus numbers are like at different, in different places. Uh, because we recognise that it's important that we continue to keep uh, treating MS adequately, despite some risks around coronavirus. Yeah, I think that's been a, a bit of a challenge for everyone over the past um, six months. So there's been a lot of collaboration with uh, patients and neurologists. Um, can you talk or, or elaborate a little bit more about the treatments that are now available for progressive forms of MS? And do you think there are some groups... Um, that perhaps will particularly benefit from this? Yeah, so I might start with um, saponimot. Uh, so uh, this is a, uh, uh, was only recently announced uh, by the Minister 
that uh, uh, this drug uh, was to be put on the, uh, the PBS um, and is now currently available on the PBS uh, for patients with uh, secondary progressive MS. Uh, it's an oral therapy, quite similar to fingolimod, which already exists for relapsing remitting MS. Uh, but the benefit of saponamod is that it's the, uh, the only medication uh, which is, uh, has been shown in phase three clinical trials to slow disability uh, progression in MS, uh, in secondary progressive MS, I should say. Uh, the other medication um, that I think we should talk about here is uh, ocrelizumab. Unfortunately, this is not yet available. Um, but ocrelizumab, which is uh, intravenous therapy currently uh, available for patients with relapsing MS, um, is the only medication which has been shown in phase three trials to slow disability progression in patients with uh, primary progressive MS. And at the moment, uh, uh, ocrelizumab is currently under review by the PBS in Australia uh, about whether it's going to become available uh, for the indication of primary progressive MS. And I'm, uh, I'm quite confident actually that uh, there will be a positive decision about that in the near future. And then to answer your question about who's most likely to benefit from the therapies, well, actually, um, it's the same answer really for both saponamod and ocrelizumab. Um, and that is uh, patients who are fairly early on uh, in their uh, secondary progressive or primary progressive disease course, uh, who still have uh, significant mobility. Um, and also uh, in those patients who have evidence of ongoing inflammatory activity, whether that be they're still having some superimposed relapses on top of their progression, uh, where they're having new uh, MRI lesions forming on their MRIs, uh, they seem to be the patients who are most likely to benefit from both therapies. Okay, so there's a few kind of creeping up, um, which may be available for use very soon, which is super exciting. But I'm, I'm also told that there's been a number of medications that have actually been reviewed recently by Australia's TGA or, or Therapeutic Goods Ad Administration. So can you explain what they are and what this might mean? Uh, yeah, so there's always drugs being reviewed at different times. So uh, for those who aren't familiar, the Therapeutic Goods Administration is uh, part of the uh, federal government's Department of Health. And their brief is to review new medications and medical devices uh, to see if they uh, have reached sufficient levels of quality, uh, safety and efficacy uh, to be allowed to be used on the Australian population. So, uh, so the TGA makes that uh, approval. And when it does that, the drug can be prescribed uh, in, uh, in the country, but often uh, the, 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 the price is very uh, high and beyond affordability for most people, uh, which is why the next step is then usually to move on to the PBS, um, uh, uh, where it's reviewed again in a bit more detail by, by the, the PBS, which is a separate authority, the PBAC, uh, who look further into this, the, again, the safety, quality, efficacy, um, and determine uh, what they think is the right price um, to set uh, for the drug companies via negotiations that they can, uh, that they can subsidise the medication for Australians. So the, the, the drug that's been most recently TGA approved for uh, a relapsing remitting MS in Australia is uh, Ozanamod. Uh, again, this is a drug that works very similarly to uh, Fingolimod, which is already available. It's an oral therapy. And again, there's good phase three data to show that it's an effective oral therapy for treating relapsing remitting MS. Uh, the main advantage of Ozanamod over Fingolimod is that it seems to have a slightly better safety profile. So there's fewer uh, first dose cardiac problems with Ozanamod. Uh, and it also appears to be a little safer in terms of its effect on the liver uh, in terms of uh, infection risks and um, on the degree of uh, lymphocyte reduction that it can, uh, can take place in the blood. Okay, so there's, God, I, I, I'm going to have to go back and rewatch all this, I think, to get across all those medications. It certainly seems like there's a lot happening um, and getting onto the PBS, which seems really crucial. But look, Let's, let's look ahead a little bit. What's potentially coming up the pipeline in terms of, are there any clinical trials which have got really promising results coming out that you're enthused by? Um, well, yeah, at the moment, uh, you know, in terms of what's coming in the, in the pipeline, uh, I mean, as I mentioned, 
uh, azanamod um, uh, is one such medication which hopefully will be available in the near future. Uh, I think in addition to that, um, ofatumumab is another drug uh, which uh, is currently undergoing TGA um, uh, review. It's a drug similar to uh, ocrelizumab, which we currently have available for relapsing MS. And again, it would be a drug for relapsing forms of MS. Um, but if this uh, eventually comes through, um, it will be a drug that can be administered subcutaneously. So patients can learn to inject themselves um, uh, under the skin once a month uh, with the therapy, uh, which saves them having to go into the hospital every six months, which is what they currently have to do for ocrelizumab. Uh, so that would be the advantage of ofatumumab. Uh, another therapy that uh, I think is uh, promising is uh, ivabrutinib. Um, so this is a new type of um, MS therapy, a new class of therapy, which hasn't been looked at before. It's called a BTK inhibitor. Uh, and this therapy is currently uh, undergoing phase three trials around the world. Uh, again, uh, this is for patients with relapsing MS or uh, secondary progressive MS, which is still active in some ways. In other words, uh, MRI lesions or uh, relapses taking place. Um, and the phase two data on that was uh, showed that it, it, it might be a very effective uh, oral therapy um, with relatively few side effects. And so um, I'm hoping that uh, you know, at the conclusion of that phase three trial, that will be another potential therapy that we'll have down the track. And then Lastly, a lot of people are always asking where we're up to with uh, autologous hemopoietic stem cell transplant or AHSCT. Uh, so many of you will know that that's a very promising therapy in relapsing remitting MS. Uh, there's a lot of uh, small studies uh, which have shown that it appears to be a highly uh, efficacious therapy for relapsing uh, remitting MS. Uh, but what we don't know is just how efficacious is it. So a, a clinical trial which is currently underway, a phase three trial that will hopefully give us a better answer about that. Uh, we'll be comparing it uh, to alamtuzumab, uh, which is, I, I believe, is probably the, uh, the best uh, and most uh, highly efficacious MS therapy that we currently have available for relapsing remitting MS. So that will really give us, the answers from that trial will give us uh, a much better answer of where AHSCT is placed. Um, bearing in mind, though, that there is a potential, um, it's very hard to blind uh, patients to whether they're receiving alamtuzumab or uh, AHSCT, and so that may interfere a little bit with our interpretation of the results. It has the potential to slightly bias in favour of AHSCT, so we'll have to think about that when the results do become available. That's a, a wealth of information you've given us this morning. Thank you, Associate Professor Hardy. That's, it's, it's so interesting to hear directly the insights of a neurologist who's helping people with MS on a regular basis. And look, the fact that you have such hope for what's coming out in the future, that gives us hope. So thank you so much for that input this morning. Thank you. All right, so now still to come, we do have Dr. Yvonne Learmont joining us from Perth to tell us more about a holistic approach to managing MS through adapting your lifestyle. And then we'll have our Q&A session where we put your pre-submitted questions to our export, experts. rather. But before that, I'd like to mention MS Research Australia's Kiss Goodbye to MS fundraising campaign, the May 50K. The May 50K challenges participants to run or walk 50 kilometres throughout the month of May to raise funds to leave MS where it belongs, which is behind us. So this year was actually only the second year of the campaign and despite being smack bang in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, we had an incredible 35,600 people who signed up to participate in the virtual challenge. Now, incredibly, that's actually more than the number of people who are living with MS in Australia. But even more amazing was actually the collective efforts of the MS community who raised a staggering $6.6 .6 million to accelerate Australian MS research. Now, as one of the over 25,600 Australians who are living with MS and a participant in the May 50K, I was completely blown away by this effort from the kiss goodbye to MS community and the generosity, of course, of their friends, family and colleagues. So here's a little bit more information about the campaign.
All right, so look, I'm definitely keen to get involved again in 2021, as I think that it's actually pretty vital that the funds raised go exclusively towards funding MS research, because research developments that have gotten us to where we are and will ultimately help us to stop and reverse MS. And although May does feel a while off, there's no time like the present to register your interest in taking part in the 2021 event. You can register as an individual, as a team, or you could even get your workplace involved. It takes less than two minutes to register, so simply head over to the may50k.org. All right, so now it's time for me to hand back over to my co-host, Dr. Julia Morahan, who will be chatting to our next expert, Dr. Yvonne Leamont. Thanks, Brioni. I can't re reiterate enough how thankful we are to all of you who took part in or donated to the May 50K. You have enabled us to continue the vital work through these uncertain times that is getting us closer and closer to our goal of stopping and reversing MS. So I know that the team at MS Research Australia are already looking forward to taking on the May 50K in 2021, so game on. Now, next up, we are going to hear about managing MS through adapting your lifestyle, a holistic approach from Dr. Yvonne Learmonth. Dr. Learmonth is a neurological physiotherapist and a senior lecturer in exercise science at Murdoch University in Perth. She's also a senior lecturer at the Perot Institute for Neurological and Translational Science in WA and within the Centre for Molecular Medicine and Innovative Therapeutics at Murdoch University. Dr. Learmonth has over 10 years experience in MS research with a focus on the role that physical activity can have in the management of MS symptoms. She is also one of the authors of the physical activity section of our recently published Modifiable, Modifiable Lifestyle Factors Guide from MS Research Australia. And we're very grateful for her work on that project. So welcome from over in Perth, Dr. Limop. So we know that drug therapies are an important part of managing MS, of course, but the evidence also suggests that there are many areas of people's lifestyles which could also be adapted that could help empower them to manage their MS. Would you be able to tell me a little bit more about this? Thank you, Julia. Of course I can. So I agree that drug therapies are very important in the management of MS. However, people with MS are expressing more interest in wellness topics than pharmacological therapies for their disease management. So I'd just like to focus on three of those areas um, to help people empower themselves to manage their MS. So I'd like to focus on physical wellness, nutritional wellness, and mental and emotional wellness. So with physical wellness, there is convincing evidence that exercise and physical activity can improve walking, balance, fatigue, depression, and quality of life in people with MS. And there's also many benefits in relation to cognition, anxiety, and pain. Evidence from the general population indicates that exercise and physical activity reduces the prevalence of comorbidities like severity of acquiring other health conditions such as diabetes, obesity or heart disease. And it is logical to assume that in people with MS, if they are more physically active and do more exercise, that they can prevent contracting these other illnesses as well. And the benefits of exercise and physical activity are true across the disability range for individuals with MS. It's important to think of physical activity and exercise a little bit different from traditional rehabilitation because it's something that you can do yourself to empower your management of your disease. So being physically active and exercise can help you take ownership of and make decisions about your own future. Then I'd also like to talk to you about nutritional wellness. There's emerging evidence that the value of maintaining a healthy diet for people with MS is really, really important. Evidence tells us that higher scores on a healthy diet index through eating a lot of fruit and vegetables and having low meat intake in your diet has positive associations with less depression, lower levels of disability and higher quality of life for individuals with MS. So overall, there's no strong evidence for any one diet for individuals with MS, but in general, we would advise you to follow the Australian guidelines on nutrition. 
And then finally, I'd just like to touch on mental and emotional wellness. So mental health and emotional wellness plays a really important role in the overall quality of life for individuals with MS. Sadly, depression affects one in every three individuals with MS, and there is a definite link between depression, pain, and reduced quality of life. And anxiety too is common in MS because it is associated with negative health. However, on the positive side, individuals with MS tend to show strong resilience and it's good to be able to harness that. So we'd be advising you to check in with mental health experts such as clinical psychologists and for yourself to check in with your mental health. And you can do this through, again, taking control, control of your MS management through perhaps physical activity and exercise and controlling things like diet. Thanks, Yvonne. It's all so interesting the way that the field has evolved. Um, so I've been thinking about your specialty area of physical activity and how it was traditionally perceived and how that's really changed over the years. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Sure. Um, so, yes, I've been involved in the area of physical activity and exercise for around 10 years now. But over the last 30 or so years, there's been a tremendous growth in our knowledge of the benefits of physical activity and exercise in people with MS. Scientific evidence and expert opinion does suggest that exercise is the single most effective factor after pharmacological treatments for managing MS symptoms. But as you've mentioned, traditionally exercise hasn't always been viewed in this way. However, there's actually case reports that go back 150 years indicating that exercise has been used as a treatment in MS. However, in the 19th century, there wasn't really a clear stance on what it was we should be doing or we should be suggesting for people with MS to manage their health through exercise. However, after the Second World War, there was major advancements in healthcare for people around the world, and that included people with MS. And then in the middle of the last century, national MS societies around the world started to realise that evidence-based practice was important, and that also included additional therapies beyond pharmacological treatments, such as exercise therapy. So as I've mentioned, over the last 30 years, there's been major improvements in our understanding and our work over here um, in Perth is looking at a range of different exercise programs in MS. We're looking at telehealth, we're looking at music, using music therapy to improve exercise behaviour in people with MS. And we're also looking at virtual reality in MS. So there's a lot of different things we can be looking at in the future to keep the field going strongly forward. Yeah, that's really great. So as we mentioned in the intro, um, you recently undertook a review of the evidence of physical activity in MS in conjunction with MS Research Australia and we produced some guidelines. So could you tell us a bit more specifically about what the evidence says now and the recommendations that we would like to offer people with MS around physical activity? Yes, yeah, so we did work all together on that, and in particular, I worked with Professor Fu Huang at the Neuroscience Research Australia Institute, and yourselves, the team at MS Research Australia. And we identified that there's unequivocal strong evidence to the benefits of exercise in MS, in particular, for managing fatigue, for managing depression, for managing quality of life, mobility, and strength. So we do have recommendations in place. These recommendations have actually been in place for a number of years. In particular, we would be recommending that people build up to be able to do two aerobic exercise sessions a week for about half an hour. And we want you to be working at a moderate level of intensity, so getting a little bit out of breath. And they would also be recommending that you do two strength-based exercise sessions per week those recommendations are for people with mild to moderate levels of MS. So you might have some walking difficulties or no walking difficulties at all. Now, as we kind of know, lots of people with MS actually are already active and I'm sure many of them took part in the May 50k this year and hopefully next year as well. So for those individuals who are already active, 
the guidelines and the recommendations suggest that they should be doing five sessions of aerobic exercise a week to get benefits for their MS symptoms. And we would be suggesting that you do 40 minutes per day of moderate to vigorous aerobic exercise, plus importantly, maintaining your strength through two sessions of strength exercises a week. That's perfect. So a lot of people with MS have issues with heat and some are obviously at a more advanced stage of their disease with more accrued disability. For example, they use a wheelchair. So do we have any advice for those people for whom exercise might be a bit harder? Yes, can definitely help with advice there. So in relation to heat, the best advice is to exercise at times of day or in places where it's most cool, to wear cool clothing and to stay hydrated, of course, drinking water. For those who do have more advanced MS symptoms, the current advice is actually based on opinion because we don't have, have as strong research there. But certainly, exercise is possible for those with more severe levels of MS symptoms. We would be suggesting that you take part in breathing exercises every day. You can be doing upper limb or arm exercises every day. And you can be doing these things on your own, taking ownership for your own health management. Or you could be working with a healthcare professional to do stretching exercises or basic walking exercises. Great. So as you know, the Modifiable Lifestyle Factor Guide covered a number of different topics, including smoking and diet. So are there other, some other key messages that would, you would like people with MS to take away today? Yes, um, there are. One important area that I hadn't already mentioned is the relevance of smoking and MS. So stopping smoking really is the number one thing that anyone with MS needs to do right away. Not only does smoking and passive smoking increase the risk of getting MS, smoking increases the risk of MS progressing as well. Smoking increases the risk of early death in MS in comparison with people who have never smoked. So stopping smoking at any time really is beneficial. And remember, stopping smoking decreases the chance of developing other conditions such as cancer, heart disease and stroke. Yes, exactly. One of our absolute key messages from the guide is stopping smoking at any time, whether you're at risk of getting MS or, or already living with MS is very likely to be beneficial for you. So thank you for sharing these evidence-based recommendations with us today, Yvonne. Um, we very much appreciate you joining us all the way from Perth. No problem. Thank you. And hopefully everyone enjoys the day today. <laughs> I really hope you, all of you at home enjoyed hearing from the researchers as much as I did. So we're about to launch into our question and answer session where I'll be putting your pre-submitted questions to our expert panel. So how's it all looking, Brioni? Oh, look, Julia, there were certainly plenty of questions that came through uh, before the event. And I know that you're hoping to put as many of these to the panel as we possibly can in the time that we have. Now, look, some, a lot of people had quite similar questions. And so we've tried to collate some of these questions into what appears to be common areas of interest. I, I should also note that unfortunately, we, uh, the panelists are unable to answer questions around personal situations or personal treatment options. Uh, but we would urge you to speak to your neurologist if you have any concerns around these areas. So, Julia, I'm going to leave the next segment in your capable hands. Back to you. Thanks, Brioni. Now, I'd like to welcome back all three of our expert MS researchers, Associate Professor Kayleen Young, Associate Professor Todd Hardy, and Dr Yvonne Limont. So, let's get going and kick off with our first question. So, I think this first one is for Kayleen. So from a patient's perspective, the ultimate ideal outcome of successful remyelination would be fully restored function due to the reversal of damage. How close do you think we are to this? And what is the earliest time that you think successful remyelination therapies could be accessed by patients? So this is a question from Stephanie, and we've also had very similar ones from Rosie, Gemma, 
John Ann and Hilary and many more people too. So what do you think? This is an exciting time for remyelination treatments. We have a number of them that are in clinical trials and we have a number, have identified, um, I guess as a research field, a number of drugs that are already being used for other conditions that may be able to promote remyelination and they could probably move through the clinic quite quickly. Um, so I believe the five to 10 year time period, the people with MS starting to see these treatments um, being delivered through their neurologist is quite realistic. Um, in terms of the level of repair a person is likely to see with MS is, um, after a remyelination treatment is given, this is largely going to depend on how advanced their multiple sclerosis already is. So for a person newly diagnosed, a remyelination treatment alongside their um, um, immune modifying treatment could actually mean that they live their lives effectively with no accumulation of disability, um, and that is something they then don't have to worry about. For a person whose disease has already progressed um, to the point where they, um, are, they have increasing, worsening disability, um, remyelination treatments are unlikely to restore function completely back to what they had prior to MS. But we do expect that even at some later stages, the delivery of these treatments could effectively pause and even um, achieve some level of reversal. That is ultimately, yeah, the, the efficacy of these treatments is really going to depend on how early we can get in and start treating. All right, so I think this next question is for Todd. So we had quite a few questions around treatments for the different forms of progressive MS, primary progressive MS and secondary progressive MS, in particular questions from Lachlan and Helen around primary progressive MS and also Elaine, Robert and Susan asked about secondary progressive MS. Um, and you touched a little bit on some of these uh, treatments and upcoming treatments before, Todd, but could you give us a little bit more information about any new treatments that are coming up in the near future to help manage those progressive forms of MS? Uh, yeah, sure. So, uh, I mean, the first thing I'd want to say there is that this is a really hot topic uh, at the moment in uh, you know, MS research. Over the last few years, we've uh, a number of therapies have been developed, obviously, which are uh, are very effective against uh, relapsing disease. Uh, and so as a result, uh, you know, a lot of attention has turned towards uh, uh, progressive forms of MS. And so I'm very uh, optimistic um, that we'll continue to make some great strides uh, in that uh, area. Um, look, one, one medication I might talk about um, is mesitinib. Um, some results were presented recently at the big the combined ECTRIMS, uh, ECTRIMS meeting, which uh, took my attention uh, and I thought were very interesting. So mesitinib is another one of these uh, BTK inhibitors uh, that I mentioned before, um, which uh, uh, prevent activation of B cells and act on microglia. And uh, there was some evidence from a phase two trial that was presented uh, showing, uh, and, and the trial was done actually in patients, uh, interestingly, both with primary progressive MS and with uh, non-active secondary progressive MS. So people who are secondary progressive MS who are progressing, they don't have changes on their MRI scan. They don't necessarily have relapses going on. Um, so this is a, a particular group of patients who are crying out for new types of therapies. And that, that phase two trial was very encouraging. The results showed uh, efficacy of mesitinib uh, across a number of endpoints, um, uh, disability endpoints. Uh, for, in both primary progressive MS and in non-active secondary progressive MS. Uh, and so my understanding is that they are going to go ahead now with a phase three trial uh, of that medication. And so I think that's a very much a, a watch this space. Yeah, thanks, Todd. I think it was so exciting to see um, progress in that area, which, as you say, has been uh, an area that's been neglected for some time and it's just so so nice to be able to have things coming up in the pipeline that could really make a difference to people. So that's really great. So I've got another question here from Trudy, um, which I think is for Yvonne. And as we mentioned, we went through quite a number of modifiable lifestyle factors for our recently launched guides. But Trudy was specifically wanting to know that 
to look at improvements in her MS, and we know that not all of the factors did show improvements as we were looking at the evidence, which are the ones that can truly help you improve your MS? Sure, thanks very much for your question, Trudy. That's really, really, really important to consider what you can do to help manage um, your symptoms and manage your MS. And as I've mentioned, physical activity and exercise really seems to be the salient or one of the most important management strategies. Definitely, you can start doing exercise at any point, and you can start this off at a really gentle level and progress to reaching those guidelines. I would be recommending, of course, that you speak to a local physiotherapist, occupational therapist, or exercise physiologist to give you personal advice. But really, we can see major differences in people's health if they start doing more physical activity and exercise. You can see improvements in your mobility and in your strength. And also over time, you will be able to see improvements in fatigue as well as hopefully improvements in your overall quality of life. Okay, so we've got another one here from Anita who is interested in knowing more about the genetic links of MS. So I think um, that's probably a, a good question for Todd. So she's described her situation where her father-in-law passed from compl complications of his um, long bout of MS and his sister has it. And his daughter, her 36-year-old sister-in-law, also has MS. So she was wondering how likely it was for her children to develop MS themselves. Yeah. Um, so in terms of what we know about the genetic risk of MS, we don't think about MS as being a strongly genetic condition like um, you know, uh, many other genetic conditions out there. But there's no doubt that there is a genetic contribution uh, to your risk of developing MS. And one of the reasons we know that comes from studies in identical twins, uh, which showed that if one identical twin has MS, then um, the risk of their identical sibling developing MS is about 30%. So that tells you that there is a uh, genetic component um, uh, because they're identical twins that must be part of uh, the risk. But, um, but it also tells you there must be a huge environmental aspect to it as well. Uh, that contributes as to whether somebody is likely to develop or, or not. Now, in terms of now that the overall risk in family members of developing MS then drops away, depending on how closely genetically linked you are uh, to the person in the family with MS. So that by the time um, if you have MS yourself, uh, your, the risk of your daughter having MS might be about five percent. Now. To answer your question specifically uh, here, I've not, you haven't said yourself uh, whether you have MS, Anita, uh, which would obviously make a bit of a difference. But if you don't have MS, and you're a more, uh, then your partner will have some genes that might contribute susceptibility uh, to uh, developing MS uh, in your daughter. Um, but uh, I think we'd be talking about only uh, a, a very small risk above what you would see in the general population. Um, if, however, you have MS as well, then you know the risk might be slightly higher than 5%, given that your partner has those uh, genes uh, in his makeup as well. Um, but the other thing to say about that is that there might be certain things that you can do to reduce your daughter's risk of developing MS as well. Um, certainly, you can try and make sure that she's replete with vitamin D uh, you can ensure, uh, ensure that she has a healthy lifestyle, she doesn't develop obesity, um, that she you know, eats a healthy diet, uh, and you can try and make sure that she, she doesn't smoke, and in that way you can further modify her risk of developing MS uh, positively. Thanks, Todd. That was really great. That's some really uh, perfect advice there for people that are thinking about MS within their families. Okay, so our next question is from Sharon, and it's for Yvonne, again, around the topic of exercise. Um, and so we've talked a little bit about how important exercise is for people with MS and, and people in the general population as well. But Sharon was specifically wanting to know whether someone who has MS but doesn't really do exercise regularly, would it still have an effect for them? And is it too late for a person to start exercising 
once that person with MS is already finding walking difficult at times. Thanks, Abby. Yes. So as I mentioned, it's important that we can start doing exercise at any time. It's not something that you would have had to have done when you were at school. It's something that you could start doing this week. And it's important to know that exercise is beneficial, beneficial and achievable regardless of a person's level of disability. Exercise can be achievable at a number of levels. If you do have a more progressive form of disability as a result of your MS and perhaps have problems with mobility, you can be doing breathing exercises or arm movements. And if you've got help from an assistant, you can be doing stretching exercises or practicing transferring from one chair to another. Currently, we would be recommending that you want to be building up to doing 20 minutes of exercise on most days. And this can be a combination of those breathing exercises, flexibility exercises or arm exercises. And again, if with supervision and with a trained assistant, you are able to practice doing walking, this is something else that we would recommend that you build into your exercise routine on approximately five to six days every week. Thanks, Yvonne. All right, so we've got a great question here from Fran. And I think probably Todd is best placed to answer this one. And I guess it's a question um, that all clinicians ask themselves from time to time. But she wanted to know how, how do you know whether the drugs used to treat MS are effective, given that no, mat no matter how many, if any, relapses or symptoms one has, one can't know what the situation would have been without the drugs. Someone can't be their own control. So um, there's no accurate comparison by which to measure the outcome. So how do you know as a doctor trying to treat MS in an individual that that person is getting the best drug for them and that that drug is working? Yeah, that is a great question actually. And the simple answer is we really don't know uh, um, if it, you know if it's working in any individual patient uh, easily, um, and that's why we do the clinical trials uh, because we get a sense across a range of patients whether a drug is likely to be effective or not. Uh, but when we start it in an individual, you're quite right. We don't have a control group that we can or a control person um, who's not being treated at the same time that we can compare you to. So there is a bit of uncertainty around that whether that drug is working for you. And that's why we do our best to monitor you uh, uh, clinically, uh, checking on your symptoms, um, uh, uh, examining you, uh, looking at uh, things like EDSS as a measure of whether your dis disability is increasing over time. And we do MRI scans as well to look to see if there's MRI activity. And certainly if you're having relapses or you're having breakthrough uh, activity on your scan, the drug still might be working for you on some level, but it may not be working well enough for you that we would keep you on it. We might have to switch to a, a different therapy. Um, and that's really the only thing that we have available at the moment. But there's a, a lot of research uh, at the moment going into biomarkers uh, to give us some additional information where we might be able to uh, monitor whether drugs appear to be effective or not. So a couple of things that people have mainly been looking at have been looking at uh, whether changes in brain atrophy or brain volume over time might be helping us to work out whether a medication is effective. Uh, normally, uh, everyone's brain shrinks a little bit, I'm sorry to say, uh, over time. But people with MS, their brain, who aren't being treated, their brains can shrink a little bit faster. Uh, and so in the clinic, in, in future years, we might be able to measure things like brain atrophy. And if that's increasing over time, even though you're not having new lesions, even though you're not necessarily progressing, that might be a little bit um, uh, that might be something we pay attention to, to work out whether the drug's working in you. Uh, alternatively, um, there's uh, some blood uh, serum sort of biomarkers that people are looking at. And the most promising one at the moment is called serum uh, neurofilament light chain. That's a marker of ongoing damage to axons uh, in the central nervous system. And we know that that uh, can be very high in patients with MS who are untreated. Uh, and it appears to go down when we start MS therapies. And so it might be in the future uh, once all of this is probably validated, that we'll be able to test your serum neurofilament light chains before we start a treatment 
and see whether they come down to a sufficient level uh, to show that the drug appears to be working for you. Uh, we're not quite there yet, but it's, uh, it's again a bit of a hot topic in MS research. That's a great question. Thanks, Todd, and actually a great answer as well. So um, we've also had a few other questions coming in around how people with MS can get involved in research studies and trials. And I think actually I am probably best placed to answer that question. Uh, MS Research Australia actually has a website um, which details all of the studies, research studies and clinical trials that are happening around Australia and New Zealand called mstrials.org.au. So you can go to that website and use the search function at the top to find out about trials that are located near you in areas of MS research that you're interested in. But there are also quite a few home-based and online trials that are happening at the moment, um, which people can take part in as well, no matter where they are in Australia or New Zealand. I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. I would like to thank all of the panel for their contribution and sharing of their expert insights with us today. Thanks again to our major sponsor, Bristol Myers Squibb. I would also like to thank my fantastic co-host, Brioni, for all her hard work. Oh, thanks, Julia. It has been a pleasure to join you and the three panellists today for this. Uh, and also a big thank you to everyone who's online today for this event. If you would like to watch again at your leisure, you're in luck as a recording of this event will be posted online shortly. Uh, likewise, if you know someone, maybe a family member or a friend who you think uh, might be interested in the topics that we've discussed today, uh, please go ahead and share the on-demand version of the event. This will be available to watch again on our website, msra.org.au. You can also find it on our social media channels simply search for MS Research Australia on Facebook or Twitter. To get all of the latest MS Research news direct to your inbox, sign up to our e-newsletter via the subscribe button on our website. And don't forget that the incredible Australian MS Research would not be possible without your support and generosity. You can help us stop and reverse MS by donating today to help fund vital MS research simply head to msra.org.au slash donate to make a difference. We really appreciate your support. Finally, a huge thank you to everyone at home for joining us today. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you.